Commentator Lynn Coick, in her commentary on Philippians, invites readers to imagine Paul writing the Philippian letter, imagine that scene as a painting. What would the subject be? Well, many of us, if we had to paint a painting of Paul writing this letter, many of us would probably have him at the center of the painting. Perhaps his surroundings would be dark, kind of scary or spooky, and maybe candlelight would illumine his gaunt face and his hands as he's writing this letter. Maybe in the back, we would have this Roman guard hovering over him in the shadows, ominously, menacingly. Paul, to our modern sensibilities, would be the tortured and tragic hero at the center of the painting, and the guard behind him would be the villain representing all that's wrong with the world. But Kohik asks this next. What if Paul were to paint this picture instead? I imagine a very different outcome. Or we may be tempted to center the Apostle and his heroic suffering. Paul instead would center not himself at all, but the triumph of the Gospel, even despite his suffering. Paul would downgrade himself to a minor player in the whole act. And while we might be tempted to demonize the Roman guard, to kind of show him as an inhuman and and pagan brute force, Paul would probably center him at the center of the painting, illumining him, showing that this person, who is his enemy, is actually the whole goal and mission of Paul's imprisonment. Paul has chosen to suffer. He's chosen to be here in chains so that even his enemies, the people that hate him most, might know Christ. And that's actually exactly the cadence and color of this letter, I think. Suffering in joy. Celebrating with humility the triumph of the good news regardless regardless of anything. And that's where the sermon title comes from this morning. Good news regardless. Because what we'll see, and not only this morning and the weeks to come, is this paradox in play. Is this oxymoron in action. Regardless of the suffering we face, of the troubles that come our way, regardless of that, the good news cannot be stopped. The Christian hope is this, that no president, no senate, no governor, no military, no police force, no natural disaster, no incurable disease, no economic crash, no cultural resistance, not even death, hell, or Satan himself can stop the inevitable coming of God's kingdom and Christ's eternal and benevolent reign in our world. No one can. Nothing can. Folks, you know the day and age in which we live. How it's given over to power, to anger, to despair. Think of what our communities have lived through. Just in these last three years alone, we've experienced a -a once-in-a-lifetime historic pandemic. We've seen outbursts of social unrest from every sector of the political spectrum. We've seen a flailing, if not altogether failing, economy. We've experienced these terrifying mass shootings, food shortages, the threat of foreign war, and record-breaking natural disasters. This is just the last three years. Are you tired of hearing people say that we live in unprecedented times? Oh, for those times to be precedented again. But here's the point that Paul is making. If he were in our own day and age speaking to us, I think he would have us know from this passage, whoever we might have to face tomorrow, whoever might be in a power or authority over us, we know ultimately who holds the future. And whatever may come, we can rest and trust knowing that this good news will succeed regardless. Now you remember from last week that Paul has expressed nothing but love 
and gratitude for this little congregation. Once they were given over to the worldliness of of Roman power and prestige, but now they are fully, with everything in them, fully following Jesus and humility and generosity and with compassion. See, they've gone from worshiping themselves, uplifting themselves and their status to giving freely to all in need. And on top of that, their own communities have started to resist them, if not persecute them, but they take all this in stride, always looking out not for their own needs, but the needs of others, Paul tells us. So in other words, a bona fide miracle has happened in the lives of these people and in their hearts. They've been utterly transformed. It's not that they've just adapted their behavior, attitude, or outlook. They're different people. Something has happened to them. And what has happened in their lives and together with Paul is all by the power of the Gospel. The Gospels made these people into totally different people. And Paul assures them that come what may, whatever they face down the road, whether it be to their advantage or their extreme disadvantage, the work that God began in them through their reception of this good news, He'll bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, He tells us in chapter 1, verse 6. The thing that God started in them, no matter what kind of tragedies and travesties they faced, God will finish it for them. And until then, Paul is confident that their only responsibility is just to continue to grow in love. Now that is not just growing in feelings of affection, although that's maybe a component of it, but when he talks about that, he talks about love in action. A world-transforming kind of love. That they'll continue to love by serving more, forgiving more, worshiping more, because they'll grow to know this God who saved them better and better, and in turn, they'll love even more difficult people to love. And now he's going to give them a case study, lest Paul be a hypocrite here. He's going to show in his own life at the moment how he himself is learning to grow in love. And that's where we begin our passage this morning in verse 12. Now, in Paul's situation, despite how it appears to Rome that Paul has been silenced by his prison chains. And maybe despite how it appears to the Philippians that think their beloved pastor and bishop has been defeated by the empire, and despite how it might appear to us, thinking how is a man in prison chains going to be able to do anything, the first thing that Paul says after he concludes his prayer, which we concluded last week, the first thing he says Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, all the things that have happened to me, have actually advanced the Gospel. Now, let's think about that for a second. We know that this is this letter comes towards the end of of Paul's life and, and ministry. And so we read in a place like 2 Corinthians 11, where he lists out the things that he has gone through being a servant of Christ, being a missionary. It's including, but not limited to this. He says he's been lashed, beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked, lost at sea, swept down river, in danger of robbers, chased by enemies, stalked by wild animals, had sleepless nights. He's been hungry. He's been thirsty. He's had to endure the freezing cold with little to no clothing. And that's not even to mention within the churches he served how he's had to deal with slander and betrayal and the constant pressure of having to help these small and struggling communities. That's what Paul has gone through in his life as a Christian. Paul has been ground to the gristmill of Christian living, and despite all of this, despite all of this, he says, 
everything that's happened to me has actually advanced the Gospel. See, in our world today, we think those disadvantages come to us and they hinder what God would have for our best life now. But Paul says, when these things come, all they are are handmaidens to the proclamation of the Gospel. The Gospel that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of David and the Son of God, as Paul writes about in Romans 1, that He died for humanity's redemption, Ephesians 1, that the power and the benefit of His sacrificial and substitutionary death is shared by any and all who believe, regardless of the person they were before, Greek or Jew, pagan or whatever, Galatians 6, and now Christ has been raised from the dead according to what the Old Testament Scriptures told us all along and that He will return one day to destroy every ruler, every authority, every power, including our final enemy, death. 1 Corinthians 15. That Gospel that Paul has written about in all these other letters This very Gospel, this good news, is becoming known in the most surprising place to the most surprising people. Paul says that in the praetorium, that is to the imperial guard, the very soldiers that were assigned to guard Paul from spreading it, they are coming to see the truth of the Gospel. Every disadvantage that's come along his way has led him to this moment where Paul is continuing to bless the people of the world, the enemies of God, by his suffering. Pastor Kent Hughes says that the Imperial Guard were probably about 9,000 hand-picked elite soldiers. They were the cream of the crop. They were honored with double pay, good pensions, and special assignments. Kind of like for us, maybe if we would imagine the Navy SEALs were mixed with the Secret Service. That's what you get when you have the Imperial Guard. And so here are Rome's best of the best. The brightest of the brightest. They're the most loyal, the most trusted, and the most important of the Empire soldiers. And they are chained to Paul day in, And day out, overhearing him talk about Jesus with his visitors, and whether they like it or not, hearing Paul's testimony and his conversations with them themselves. I don't know if you ever, there's an old, in the 80s they had this graphic novel, which is a prestige comic book come out called The Watchmen. They made a movie of it several years ago. And one of the characters, is he's this tough and just really violent vigilante. He goes after the worst of, of, of criminals. But he's a criminal himself because he operates outside the law. Well, both in the book and the movie, they lock him in a prison with all the people that he's put away. And he's a little short, you know, redhead guy, got freckles. He's probably five six. Doesn't seem like he's anything. And they try to fight him in this prison. He starts tearing through these guys. And he says, you don't understand. You think I'm locked in here with you, but you're locked in here with me. I think that's what Paul is feeling in this moment. You think I'm locked in here with you, but you're locked in here with me. Ironically, Paul's imprisonment, says Hughes, brought the Gospel to the very heart of secular political power and Rome. The place that was oppressing all these people groups from all these surrounding nations, Paul is at the heart of that, chipping away at that diabolical power with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And folks, here's the miracle. When Rome was the head honcho, the great empire of the day, him preaching a crucified Christ, a loving and humble God, who came to serve the worst of sinners, that message took root in the lives of these people. 
How do we know? Not only because in verse 13 where he says so that the Gospel has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. Not only that, but if you get to the end of the letter, spoiler alert, we're jumping to the end here. All the saints, he writes to the Philippians, all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Caesar! the great emperor of the known world, people in his household send you greetings as brothers and sisters in Christ. The Romans and all others know that Paul is here in prison because he says in verse 13b, because I am in Christ. He's not in prison because of a political agenda. He's not in prison because he's some sort of philosophical rabble-rouser, he is in prison because of Christ Jesus. Paul's meaning here, I think, is probably twofold. Not only is he in chains because he's preaching Christ, but that he himself, in some mystical way, is participating in Christ's own suffering by being in prison. See, church, Jesus' suffering, we know, had a purpose to it. The salvation of the human race from slavery to sin and death. That is, after all, why God became a man in Christ Jesus and died on the cross and rose from the dead. We know that Jesus came so that He might love and save sinners. And now, as we are united to Him in faith, we read this metaphor from Paul himself. That Christ is our head, He's our source, He's our authority, and we are His body. You can't separate a head and a body and the person continues to live. We have been united into God in such a way through Christ that He is our head and we are His body. And now what we do, Paul in the ancient world or us in the modern one, what we do for the sake of the Gospel, continues the work that Jesus has begun in us. He who began a good work in Jesus Christ the head will bring it to completion in the body, the church. But not only is the good news progressing and advancing regardless of Paul's chains in his own situation, but we read in verse 14 that most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment. So not only is Paul suffering, allowing for the Gospel to go forward in a mighty way in his situation, but even people, Christians around the world, hearing about what's going on with Paul has emboldened them to preach the Gospel. Now what does that mean? It means that regular Christians, just like you and me, not apostles, not super saints, regular people like us, can be emboldened in our own faith when we see the testimony of another's faithfulness even in the face of suffering. Now think about this church. Was it last, I believe it was last week we had our Lord's Supper Sunday and uh, we came together at this table, but before we do that we also, we always hear testimonies from people. When Christians you know and love are able to stand up in your midst here, And they tell you about the the pain and heartbreak they're going through, and yet they're able to praise the Lord with all sincerity, with all hope. Doesn't that help you to be able to trust Him more? If their whole world can come collapsing down and they say, but blessed be the name of the Lord, doesn't that cause you to think deeply about your relationship with Christ? If they can trust Him that much and be satisfied, could that be true for me as well? When you hear all these testimonies of grace before the Lord's Supper table, when you see the tears of joy even in the middle of praying uh, in our prayer meetings for these devastating things, doesn't it embolden you in the Lord? When you watch somebody go through the worst ordeal that you can imagine, and they come out with hope in Christ, you can't tell me that that doesn't pique your interest and how you can live that way too. I don't know about you at least, 
But it makes me want to know Jesus more, to share Him more when the people around me have profound experiences with Him and those moments of suffering. This is the effect that Paul's suffering has had on the Philippians. That they're now more bold to love more, to preach the Gospel more because of what's being accomplished even in his prison chains. When Paul says, by the way, some of Caesar's own personal household are Christians now. They don't fear Caesar, they fear Christ. It's got to embolden those Philippians. Well, I can, I can love that mean-spirited butcher down the street. I can share the Gospel with that, that mean old fruit stand dealer down the road in the marketplace. While that's happening, though, Paul tells us in verse 15 that there's something else happening. He says, but to be sure, some others preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. Now based on what he's going through, imprisonment, humiliation, perhaps even facing his own execution, in what sense would anyone want to preach Christ out of envy? if that's the final conclusion. Martyrdom. Envy of what? What are they envying? Imprisonment? Persecution? No, I think what Paul is referring to here is how that there are going to be certain people in this world that are envious of the effect that the Gospel has on others. There can be people that do not believe in Jesus at all, but see how Jesus has transformed others and that makes them envious of the power that Jesus has in the life of people. Think of this. We'll give a couple biblical examples. You remember in the book of Acts that there's uh, Simon the sorcerer and he sees the miracles the disciples are doing in the name of Jesus and he wants to go and buy the power of the Holy Spirit like he's walking into a shop and trying to buy a new magic trick. You remember that? He was envious of the Christ that they were preaching. He saw its power and he wanted it for his own selfish ambitions. Or remember the sons of Sceva? They wanted to go out and using the name of Jesus as if it were some sort of magical incantation or a spell that they could cast. (laughs) Do you remember what happened to them? How the demons said, Jesus I know. I even know Paul but who are you before chasing them out of town, beating them and stripping them naked? People can be envious of the power of the Gospel. They can see its effect in the lives of regular people. How it restores broken families. How it gives hope to the desperate. How it can make enemies reconcile. How it can even, we see, make dead children live again. How it can make evil, cruel men love and serve. How it can make sick women be healthy and whole again. All because this is done in Jesus' name. People can see the power of Jesus. This just reminds me, there's a movie out there, it's a good movie, called The Book of Eli with Denzel Washington. I haven't seen it in a long time, so I'm probably getting the plot a little bit wrong. Gary Oldman. Is, he's a great actor. He's the villain in the movie. And it's like the end of the world and Eli, the main character, Denzel Washington, has the last copy of the Bible on earth. And he's trying to protect it and preserve it so it can be copied and get back into the hands of the people. But Gary Oldman wants that Bible. Not because he believes it, because he's seen the power it can have over people. The power the Scriptures can hold over people to manipulate them, to con them. See, that's the kind of thinking that goes on in our world. Church, don't be naive. Just as there were many charlatans in Paul's own day preaching Jesus so that they could get money, fame, and power, so are there many who will do so today. Let's not be so silly as to think that every author that has a book that talks about Jesus, or any musician or actor who gets on stage thanking God for the success and the money that He's given them. 
Or that every person on TV or social media teaching what they think about the Bible, let's not be so naive to think that these folk have the name of Christ on their lips if they're not the people that have also taken His cross up on their backs. Let's not think that people that go out there and make a living being a religious guru actually mean what they say about Jesus. In America today, we know all too well about the many crooks and criminals that we've seen be televangelists on TBN for years. Or people that get tons of Grammy Awards and are on 104.7 The Fish and then apostatize and don't even... They say they don't even believe in God anymore after they've made millions of dollars singing about Jesus. We know all that. But I think too, especially in these past few years, Christians, we need to be careful to not believe that any Republican or Democrat that talks about Jesus and how He would vote for them is doing anything but using the Lord's name in vain. Let me say it clearly again. For anyone who tells you that Jesus came to be a capitalist or a socialist, that He came to be to esteem liberal or libertarian ideas, they're not interested in talking about Jesus of Nazareth, His kingdom, and His good news. They're interested in manipulating you into voting for them or believing their ideals or whatever. Watching their show. Who knows? Going on their book tour. Because Jesus Christ is totally other. He did not come to establish the American way of life. He just didn't do it. We are thankful for the many advantages and blessings we have of living in relative safety and prosperity. I know there's a lot of things left to be desired, But we're thankful for those things. But let's not get confused about who Christ is. He didn't come to establish our way of life. He came to resurrect dead people to life. He came to reconcile all sinners, no matter what previous color or creed or anything else, He came to reconcile those people to God the Father Almighty. When we have so destroyed and polluted this world, Jesus came to restore creation to its perfect state of peace and grace so that we might give Him all the glory and love and serve one another as He first intended. That's the agenda of Jesus. Anything else, you can be sure, is preaching out of selfish ambition and insincerity. Now let's be real. I like to think of myself as a realist. Everybody in this room has political opinions. Because everybody in this room believes that there are better ways than others for us to live together in this big, messy thing we call society. Everyone's got opinions on what's the best thing to do to bring the most peace, the most success to everyone. We've all got different ideas about that. And the reality is that we're going to like some of the things that some of each other think, and we're going to extremely dislike some of the other things that others think. But at the end of the day, let us all remember, all of us, that nobody is ever saved by who he or she voted for on the ballot. Nobody is ever saved because of what they believed about how this world could be delivered from its ecological or pathological or economic disasters by any human government. Here's my pastoral recommendation for you regarding important things. Politics are important. I get it because that controls people's lives and I get it's an important reality. Here's my recommendation to you about how to think about this. Read the Scriptures carefully. Pray to God earnestly and do what honors God and others to the best of your conscience and abilities and relax. The Bible does have a lot to say, a lot to say about how we ought to live, politically speaking. It tells us the people we ought to care for. 
the prophets, and Jesus Himself. We ought to care for widows and orphans, the weak, the sick, the imprisoned, the foreigner. We ought to help these people. That's what the Bible says. And it has a lot to say about how we are to participate in a society that may even be corrupt. We're to forgive our enemies. We're to try to live peacefully. We are to try to honor even the unjust emperors. That really is tough for us to stomach. But let's be real, people. Let's not be fooled by the many people who will preach Christ insincerely and for selfish ambition. Just because they're saying Jesus doesn't mean they're preaching the Jesus that we know and love. Paul in verse 16 wants us to be different. He says there are people like that, but there's also people that preach Jesus out of goodwill, out of love for God and for those that bear God's image, namely everybody. Nevertheless, there will be some that preach for money and politics and fame or whatever, and they'll try to even cause real sincere Christians' problems. These people that are preaching Jesus for selfish reasons want to see Paul in prison because he's a rival to them. They don't want to see the church grow. They want to shrink anybody that's cutting into their demographic. But here's where things get turned upside down for us. And it is, a, I feel like, a long lost truth that we need to remember in our modern world. Paul says in our last verse here, 18a, Paul concludes, what does it matter why they're preaching? What does it matter? What does it matter if they love the church or hate it? What does it matter if they seek unity or division? What does it matter if they use their gifts to bless the poor or only for their own enrichment? He says this, and it's a shock to our system, only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Christian, I know that there are a lot of people out there Preaching Jesus in ways that get under your skin. And I know that because there's a lot of people out there preaching Jesus that get under my skin. But let me encourage us as a church together, and this is myself included, let's take a page out of the Apostle Paul's playbook and trust God, preach Christ, and let everything else go. Now of course, I want to put this caveat out there. There will be people that take the name of the Lord in vain. They'll preach Jesus and they'll use it to try to literally hurt or abuse or attack other people. Now, I think that's, it's incumbent upon us when we see that to as best we can respond in the correct way. Rebuke that person and try to protect the person they're victimizing. I would never say, oh, well, somebody can be out there and, and, and literally stabbing someone to death and saying, this is what Jesus wants for you. And we just say, not my business. No, we would intervene. We'd be the good Samaritan in that scenario. Of course, that's the righteous thing to do. But, however, in our day and age, which we know is so divided, so hateful, so mean-spirited, so dishonest and distrusting, so manipulative and so cruel about other Christians and what they're doing, let's not focus on what others are getting wrong. Let's refocus all of our energy on how we individually and as a church family can come together to preach Christ and His Gospel. Let's focus on how we can love and serve and stop worrying about who else isn't doing it right. There are so many ministries today, these discernment websites and bloggers that spend all of their time talking about this church doesn't do it right, this leader doesn't do it right, this book isn't good, this video isn't good, and they spend no time talking about Jesus. Here they are saying they're supposed to be defenders of the Gospel and you've never even heard them share the Gospel before. Because they're so bent on tearing everybody else down. Paul says, who cares about that? That's in God's control. Even if they're preaching Jesus from false motives, can't the Holy Spirit work to bring people to faith even in the midst of that? If I may be so bold to ask us as a church, as individuals to think about this, who cares if the person 
preaching Jesus is conservative or liberal. Who cares if they're an Arminian or a Calvinist? Who cares if they baptize babies or only adult believers? Who cares if they have a choir or band in their congregation? Who cares if they read only from the KJV or the CSB? Who cares if they're a continuationist, meaning they think the gifts of the Spirit in the early church are continuing on, or if they're a cessationist? That stuff stopped a long time ago. Who cares if they're Catholic or Protestant, black or white, rich or poor, young or old, male or female? Paul says, I rejoice because even imperfectly and incompletely, Christ is being preached. May we have this encouragement. Not just to let other people do their thing and let them be accountable to God and for us not to be God over them. But maybe this can be an encouragement to us. That if Paul came to this church this morning and he saw us and he heard my sermon and I'd be sweating bullets up here and he would say, I'd never say it that way. I think Paul would still say, nevertheless, Jesus is being preached. And that gives me and it should give all of us hope that we don't have to have doctorates in theology or biblical studies or philosophy. We don't have to read Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek. We don't have to be great orators or apologists or rhetoricians or anything else, but may our prayer be this. And all we say and all we do, may we preach Jesus Christ and His good news imperfectly, incompletely, insufficiently, regardless. Because God will do the work that we could never do even on our best day. And so that truly is good news regardless. Let's pray. Father, help us to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified alone and nothing else. Keep us away from the petty squabbles and divisions of our day and let us so focus our whole heart and being on sharing Christ and all we say and do. For it's in His name and His name alone we pray. Amen.